just want to start this by discussing the theme of this year's uh, Hispanic Latinx Month, uh, Esperanza. So, Alison, we would like to know more about the relevance of this theme and how does it uh, fit into the current scenario? Well, hello. Welcome to Houston, Texas. Um, we are very proud to be Houston's History Museum, and we represent various cultures here in Houston. Um, and the most recent of our exhibits is behind us. It's the Mexican-American <clears throat> mural that represents their culture coming into Houston in the 20th century. And so we have homes from people that lived in there from Germany, uh, Italian, African-American, Swiss, French, but we did not have the Mexican-American culture until recently, and we are very proud of this mural. It rep like I said, it represents Houston, and I think that uh, Gracie and Dr. Prius will get more into the details of it, but we are very proud to represent them during Hispanic Heritage Month. So as far as Hispanic Heritage Month and, and how that fits in, uh, the, the, the Hispanics or Mexican Americans, mm -hmm. which form the majority of Hispanics, um, were indigenous people in Texas originally and in the in the United States, right? And so, uh, when the Spanish came in the uh, 14, 1500s, actually 1500s to the mainland, mm -hmm. um, that's how Mexican Americans. Uh, developed in this part of the world, in this part of North America. And so there were scattered communities um, that existed. The Spanish had done some exploration. They set up missions to uh, acculturate the native people uh, into the Catholic faith and also into the Spanish world community uh, and there was uh, you know mixing of ethnic groups there were uh, Spanish there were African traditions that came together to form the uh, what do we today call the Hispanic or the Mexican American community in Texas times were very rough uh, and there was because of disease and other things uh, the communities as I said were scattered uh, there were some Settlements located around missions uh, here in Houston, where we are in Southeast Texas, uh, there had large, uh, there had been a large community scattered about uh, for since uh, the Spanish came. I mean, this uh, you know, there's water and there's ample food, and so this was a nucleus of settlement in this area that we're in today, and so. <clears throat> During the frontier period, uh, as uh, Anglo settlers came in from North America, the Spanish were looking for a buffer zone. And so they allowed uh, more uh, American settlers to move in to this Southeast Texas region, become Mexican citizens, adopt the Catholic faith, learn the Spanish language, uh, and kind of act as an outpost and, and as a buffer zone to keep the United States from moving into this area. This right. was still Mexico, right? And so that went on for, uh, for about 10 years uh, until about 1835 when tensions uh, increased. There were questions over uh, African slaves uh, and, and just a massive amount of immigration. Uh, and then draconian dictatorship in Mexico under uh, Santa Ana, uh, the dictator of Mexico who threw out the constitution. And this precipitated a revolution in Texas. Right. With that, you had more, after the, after the revolution is over, you do have more Anglos moving in. In 1848, there is a war with Mexico between the United States and Mexico. And after that, this does, this Texas uh, and all the way to California becomes part of the United States. But there are still Mexican people living here. And so in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, it was decided between the United States and Mexico that those that remained 
would be full U.S. citizens. And that is how we get the term today, Mexican Americans, uh, which we have, uh, as other groups have moved in, other Spanish speaking groups have moved in. We have Cubans, we have Puerto Ricans, uh, and uh, South Americans, Central Americans. And so now we, in the 1980s, they came up with the term kind of Hispanic to as an umbrella term, but yeah. predominantly in Texas uh, and in, actually in the United States, the majority are still Mexican American. Uh, I would love to learn, you know, we have come, we have indeed come a long way since 1968 when it all started. And being a history guru, I think it would be, you know, uh, better to understand from your perspective that how far have we come, how long and how long is the way ahead? And what are we looking at, uh, you know, as our ultimate goal as a community? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I'm going to let Gracie answer part of that. But Sure. Uh, uh, and so part of that, but, um, you know, in 1968, when President Lyndon B. Johnson, who was from Texas, um, initiated Hispanic Heritage Week, mm -hmm. um, not a lot of people knew who Mexican Americans or Hispanics were. Predominantly, they were located in California and Texas, with some in uh, in California and Texas, with some in places like Colorado and Arizona, New Mexico. Um, but Lyndon Johnson had spent a year as a public school teacher when he was learning to be a public school teacher, working with Mexican Americans in South Texas, and he saw poverty and racism. Um, and he uh, chose to start working against that. And so uh, he, as president, uh, you know, he passes a lot of education bills, a lot of bills to help uplift people, uh, including Mexican Americans and African Americans, passes civil, uh, signs civil rights legislation. Um, and so when he starts it, Mexican Americans aren't very well known, but by the 1980s, um, the Census Bureau had predicted that Mexican Americans, Hispanics, would become uh, part of the new majority in the United States. Absolutely. By eight, 19, in 1968, probably about 10 to 15 percent of the population. By 1980, 30 percent and growing. Today, we're at 40 percent. We are, you see Mexican Americans, and you have always, there's always been Mexican American leadership. There's always been a Mexican American business community. There's been Mexican Americans in government all that time. But by the 1980s and 90s, you start seeing a growing number. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're more visible. Uh, our presence is, is recognized throughout, right now in Texas. Uh, Mexican American Hispanic children make up the majority of the school population. In we haven't gotten our census figures yet. Maybe by the start of Hispanic Heritage Month on September 15th, we might get some usable data. Uh, but because of COVID, we've been delayed. And we're expecting to be 40 to 50 percent of the population by that time. So we have made tremendous gains, uh, increasing our presence uh, across the board. Dr. Preuss, I just want to add that in the 2019 census, and I have the data right here in front of me, uh, there was 43.7% of the population here in Houston that was of Hispanic origin. And uh, the Anglo population was at 28%, 28.7. The African-American population was at 20%. We have an, a growing Asian community that is also quickly growing and it's at seven, it was at 7.3. So at that time, uh, our population was the largest minority population here in Houston. Needless to say, we were also the youngest. So well over half of our, our the good majority of our, our population, one was under the age of 18, and uh, many of them were U.S. citizens, and not not uh, you. Many of them were residents and not U.S. citizens, I should say. Absolutely. So uh, that also gives to the fact that uh, while we are a growing population in many regards, we have yet to attain the equity. I think that uh, we deserve in light of 
the needs that we have in this community. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all that information. I think it's it's I I couldn't agree with you more that you know given that uh, you know there's a big part of the population that come from this community that comes from this community, and I think they have had their presence known, felt, and their contributions appreciated in not just one but you know various fields, be it music, be it you know uh, technology, be it some you know you name it and everyone. And the one thing I that I love about your community and it resonates with our community. here in india as well is the importance of family um that is something that yeah uh, that you know kind of resonates so nicely and so my next question would be for you prasiela and thank you so much for sharing answering a part of the question and i'd like to thank dr proyas for uh, sharing all that information again and uh, all right so uh Graciela, uh, we have gone through uh, the data and the researches, and even the numbers say that a large part of the Hispanic Latin community, Latinx community, has faced discrimination, as uh, Dr. Proyas also mentioned, in some or the other way, be it in education, employment, or the status in the society. And as a community engagement expert and a law custodian, uh, what do you think are the major challenges? uh the roadblocks uh, faced by the people of your community and and what needs to be changed and what needs to be done to kind of rectify them um in a minute i would like to uh take you through the mural because the mural really depicts the history yes. of the mexican american community here in houston mm -hmm. and uh, and this mural really speaks to me personally because i was born and raised here in houston Uh, I grew up uh, in uh, in a barrio, and uh, that's the the Spanish name for neighborhood, called El Crisol. And uh, and yes, uh, Houston was a segregated city in the 18 and early 1900s, and the discrimination existed. And so, the, as the community was growing, unfortunately, the needs were never met. Uh, education, what employment, housing, all of the different things that are necessary to really build a community. So um, I, I saw a lot of what was taking place, uh, and one of the most important things I feel for us is the need to be educated. We have the highest dropout rate still in the in our in our schools. Uh, and I think the most important thing that we're realizing is that if our children do not read by the age by the third grade, the likelihood is that they will end up as a dropout and will not graduate. And in an economy such as Houston, we we need the workforce, the future workforce, to be ready and prepared. That's right. And it. requires more than just a high school education now uh and so that is one of the biggest challenges right now the Houston Independent School District has well over 60% 60 plus percent of the population are hispanic mm. the next highest is about 28% which is african american so in a school which is uh, considered one of the largest in Texas it is really faced with some major major problems our community is is continuing to to help uh and the history and the knowledge of our our people is so important to be able to present with them um a sense of pride they belong here they're here they belong here and they will become part of the economic fabric and success of this community and this country So in that regard I think uh education is is very important. The other one is housing. Um uh, the thing about our community while we have less homelessness the reality is that we have great needs for multi-generational housing. And that's one of the things that is coming up as more and more research is being done since we will be soon a majority of the population how are we going to address that how are we going to create this housing for uh, multi-generational communities uh and i think that you uh, in your communities understand that as well because you're very similar to to what we have as well yes. so housing is another issue 
employment. Employment is, is very key. Uh, as they say, one of the biggest challenges for the increase in violence and, and, and uh, crime in our community has been most of the time because people are not working. They get desperate and they do things that they should not be doing. So uh, I think employment is, is one of the key areas in a community such as, as Houston. We have different industries. We have, of course, uh, of course uh, very fortunate to have the Port of Houston. We have international airports. We have you know universities, colleges, sports teams, everything that you, someone would want for the quality of life, I think, uh, to be successful. There's so many, uh, I think, amenities that Houston has and, and we're very proud of it. But at the same time, this growing population has yet to be well integrated into the economic fabric of the city itself. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the beautiful answer and for the challenges and also not just challenges, being a person of law, you've also provided us with some solutions that what needs to be done as, uh, you know, as I asked. And that's something that's really amazing to kind of hear and understand. And yes, please, we would love, we would all love to see the murals and, you know, help us take a tour of that virtually in this world. And we're standing in front of Mexican American history mural uh, it prepared by the Heritage Society, I should say, funded by the Heritage Society at Sam Houston Park. Uh, I've been tasked to give you a little explanation of what is actually on this mural. Having been born and raised here in Houston, a lot of the images that I see here impacted my family and me. So starting off with uh, the Mexican-American community holds uh, very dearly their families. And a very important part of family is grandparents, los abuelos. So in this part of the imagery, you will see grandpa, grandma, and the children. We, in many respects, have multi-generational uh, families. So it's mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, cousins, and children in our households. Here you will see a replica of the uh, LULAC Clubhouse. Uh, this clubhouse was actually bought in 1955 by the League of United Latin American Citizens, Council 60. And it was, at, was bought in the 50s, unfortunately because they kept getting harassed by the police when they met. And so they decided it would be best for them to hold a house on their own that they could meet and enjoy family and festivities and help with the many issues that the community was facing, including discrimination, civil rights violations, uh, police abuse, uh, lack of education and lack of opportunity. The list goes on. The history of the LULAC uh, house is amazing and the people that made the decisions and what went on was also very important to what took place here in Houston. You also have uh, several houses that were important to the community uh, that are painted throughout this mural. You have the railroad uh, line that in many respects uh, was very important to the economy of Houston. And in the early 1900s, there were many Mexican laborers that were actually picked up throughout Mexico through the villages and brought into Houston. Uh, and that's how my family ended up here. My grandfather uh, actually came as a laborer and him and his brother, my older uh, uncle Cipriano, ended up working for the railroads for many years. Unfortunately, uh, in the 1930s during the depression, there was a huge removal of Mexican citizens from throughout the southwest western part of the United States. And because of that removal, my father, who was only six years old, was also removed. He was born here. He was actually baptized at Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is depicted over there. And uh, lucky for him, because that was the basis upon which he was able to get a delayed birth certificate to show that he was a U.S. citizen. We have important uh, community members that actually uh, were important to us because they, they became university professors, they graduated, and they became important to uh, fighting our civil rights uh, cases. The Mexican League uh, 
unfortunately, again, Houston was segregated. We had segregated uh, schools, segregated um, even our sports teams. So we had a Mexican league that actually played and they were very, very, um, I would say, important to the entertainment uh, of all our, our community neighborhoods. The barrios used to all get together and go to the baseball games uh, by the Mexican League. Again, the port, uh, another important uh, part of Houston and our community in many respects uh, provided labor. But unfortunately, the longshoremen uh, kept many Mexicans from uh, being able to get some of the good jobs until much later when they actually fought and got an opportunity to become longshoremen and part of the economy through the port. We have here Nifa Lorenzo. Uh, Mama Nifa is with everybody so fondly remembered her. She was a, a, a businesswoman. She had a family. She was a widow. And the only thing she knew how to do, well, I shouldn't say the only thing, but one of the things that she did in order to provide for her family was start a small Mexican restaurant. That res restaurant became uh, a very popular place for many Houstonians to go and eat. She was the best of hostess when uh, it came to to making sure everyone was treated fairly and delighted in her cuisine. Uh, she became an ambassador to the city of Houston before her death. Um, again, this particular image is again, the mother, the importance of the mother figure in our community is, is very, uh, I think, well represented here. You have the children around her, almost like the Madonna, you know, in a way, but it's because the, uh, the woman was important in, in uh, many respects. It's interesting to note that this young Latina has books. This is this is what my mother told me. This is, Mijita, tu educación. So to her, even though she came from a rural community, uh, she was not well educated, but she knew the importance of an education to her children in order to succeed here in the United States and in Houston. Again, because of the segregated communities, many uh, businesses uh, took place uh, so that they could cater to the community. So you have the entertainment of El Teatro Azteca, very popular theater, cinema. They brought movies from Mexico and Latin America to the community. So they, they were very popular in the 50s, 60s, and even through the 70s until they finally closed. We have the Pan American Nightclub, uh, which uh, many people said was um, the largest dance hall this side of the Mississippi. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because it actually had three very large dance halls and it, and it was very popular for uh, community. This was one of the few places that the community could come and host their events, such as their weddings, their quinceañeras, their birthdays, their baptisms, anything we had to celebrate, it was at the Pan American nightclub. And I remember it fondly because my family, I came from a family of nine, plus mom and dad is 11. Uh, the way we made ends meet was by, by um, the maintenance at this nightclub. We would clean it up after the dances. Uh, not a happy memory there, but <laughs> but the interesting thing is I got to know a lot about my community. Uh, whenever anybody became rowdy at that location, they actually had a jail cell. And they would put everybody in the jail cell there until the end of the dance, and then they would haul them off uh, to jail at the end of the dance. Uh, this particular KLBL was actually started by the Morales family. Uh, the Morales family were a business family that uh, had the first funeral home, but it also started the first Spanish-speaking radio station. KLBL was important to our community because in many respects, not only for entertainment, information. This was the radio station that could provide them information about jobs, and it also provided them emergency information. So in case of a, a hurricane, in case of uh, bad weather, it, it was the radio station for our community. Again, uh, it was Spanish speaking. It allowed uh, those individuals that would normally did not have access to some of the other radio stations to be able to do programming here. Very important uh, during this, the 50s, 60s, and I think up to the 70s. 
We have the, the uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church here. It's uh, This particular church is over 100 years old. It's in the second ward of Houston. And it was actually constructed because, again, Houston was segregated. This church was built for the Mexican community. And this is where my father was baptized uh, back in 1926. He is 95 years old now. And, uh, and it was a good thing because they had his birth certificate that showed that he was born here in Houston. And he was able to get his uh, proof of citizenship and was able to come back from Mexico at the age of 18. Uh, this is Mr. Centeno. He was a very popular musician. Uh, he was born without an arm, but he blew his horn with just one arm. He was amazing. Uh, he played with some of the biggest orchestras around, uh, and he was lovely. His daughter, uh, who was Norma Centeno, Norma again, was uh, a very popular uh, songstress. She entertained so many of us, absolutely one of the most beautiful souls. She was taken from us much too early. Uh, and uh, Norma and her father and her brothers uh, had the Centeno group. And again, I've provided some incredible um, songs and merengues and salsas and everything. We are very festive uh, when it comes to, to music. And our community works hard, but loves to play hard as well. So entertainment, very important. Here you see the different, uh, again, because our community was so segregated, many times our Spanish speaking community would not be able to get information but during the 19, early 1900s, they had, uh, we had more Spanish language newspapers than anywhere around. And then they became very important in the 70s uh, to get information back out as to what was actually happening in our communities. So the Chicano movement, uh, immigration issues, uh, you know, all sorts of of issues that were going on uh, and were taking place. That's the way we got our information. Abarrotes, and here we go, the tamales, aguas frescas. This is, this is uh, a store that you can buy, and everybody in our barrios had a little store that we, tiendita, that we would go and buy of what we needed. And in our little barrios, we always had our little taqueria, we had our panaderia. And I'm not sure that building, but we also had our cantinas. I don't see anything about cantinas here, but uh, that was also part of it. Again, the uh, this house, I think it's the Rust House, uh, that was also uh, used uh, and popular in, in our uh, off navigation. That became, I believe, uh, for our, our teenagers and um, again, a social service agency in many respects. We went on our, our war heroes that uh, were, were very important um, because we were definitely part of this community. We, we had uh, community members who were also um, important. The Felix uh, or the Fraga family, this is Felix Fraga. Felix was an educator and then became a social worker and worked with the Ripley House for many years before he went on to uh, city council. He was also one of the first um, baseball players as far as the Hispanic League over there was concerned. We had more uh, decorated uh, soldiers, I think, than any other community uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, Roy Benavides and uh, several other um, uh, soldiers that came back decorated because of their service. Our Fiestas Patrias uh, festivities were started to give history of our community, our culture, uh, and the Fiestas Patrias many uh, were started through LULAC and other uh, organizations like the GI Forum as well. Uh, many veterans organizations that helped to put these events together. It, it was parades, it was dances, it was breakfasts, it was lunches, it was to recognize the importance of maintaining our culture within this community as we were growing. We have, um, uh, this is um, our state representative, Cristina Morales. Cristina was crowned uh, Miss Fiestas Patrias at one time, and so that's how come she is depicted with a crown. Now she is a state representative. We also have Irma Galvan. Irma is a also like a Ninfa Lorenzo uh, restaurant owner. She too was a widow. She had uh, 
no other way to support her her family other than her cuisine, her, her cooking. She just, uh, not too long ago, got was the recipient of the James Beard Award. Uh, she, her her uh, restaurant has grown tremendously. And uh, whenever anybody goes and eats at Edema's, they say it's like eating at home, at home cooked meals almost. Uh, they're very, very good. And Edema has been part of this community, also an ambassador in many ways, to help people understand where we are an opportunity. Lionel Castillo was uh, our Hispanic leader in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, he was, he became a city council, uh, no, city controller, and then went on to become a uh, U.S. Immigration Naturalization uh, Director at the national level. Uh, he has also uh, part of the organizing of the Huelga schools at one time when um, the, because of the injustices in the ISDs, there was a walkout by our community to refuse. And, and because of that walkout, they created Welga schools where the students could go and still continue their education until the issues with the ISDs were ironed out. And one of the individuals that helped in that regard was Yolanda Black Navarro. Miss Navarro was a, a corporate leader in many ways, but also a community leader. She was greatly loved by so many of us. She not only was an individual with great intellect, but also had the fun side of, of her. Uh, everyone always remembered her with a huge smile. And she was always someone that could inspire people to do the right thing. Uh, that was also very, uh, we miss her. Uh, we have uh, here, unfortunately, the, the U.S. Uh, this is the depiction of Joe Campos Torres. And uh, Mr. Torres came back from uh, the Vietnam era uh, after serving two years. And unfortunately, uh, about three days after he, he got here on Cinco de Mayo, 1977, he was murdered by uh, five police officers uh, who had uh, assaulted him, uh, beat him up, taken him to jail. They wouldn't accept him. They told him to take him to the hospital instead. Instead, they took him back to what was called the hole and they threw him in the bio. And um, unfortunately, because of that, the community, there was an uprising in 1978 when the juries came back. Um, unfortunately, the other injustice that happened there was that the, the trial was held in Huntsville, of all places, which is pro law enforcement and majority of white, unfortunately, that community. And uh, they came back with a one year probation and a dollar fine for the officers. Uh, that is another story that unfortunately is, is told because this is part of our history and part of the uh, things that we, we have to overcome and we have to work together to find answers because unfortunately, even today, 44 years later, we are still seeing situations of abuse. We have the great pride of many of our community is the Jarepeo, the rodeo, very involved in a lot of rodeo activities for, uh, because of the tradition of vaqueros in Texas, many ranches, many uh, uh, horse farms and so forth. Many of the laborers are of Mexican descent. Uh, they they uh, excel in, in a lot of, of uh, the horse activities and, and uh, ceremonies. So that's depicted there. We also have the low riders in the back. The low riders are the vehicles that are uh, sometimes very common to some of our community members. Uh, these cars will uh, jack themselves up. They actually bounce along and they're kind of cool to see. They're, they are well invested in. Um, they invest thousands of dollars in these vehicles and they have car parades and they have car clubs uh, based on the low riders. Here again, the Vaquero was a statue that was created and uh, uh, by Luis uh, Jimenez. And he uh, did this to place at Moody Park. And this, the park was where the, the Campos Torres uprising uh, happened in 1978. And this was a way for the city uh, to help the community heal a bit. And this was the first piece of public art to be given to the community. Uh, and uh, 
unfortunately, there was a dispute as to whether he should be holding a gun because of the violence it depicted. But needless to say, it's still there. So the, um, the creator uh, would not change it. He wanted, he had the ability to, but he said he depicted it because a vaquero uses his gun not for violence, but for protection when he's out in the wild. And so he had, had a common sense, I think, answer to it. We have here uh, uh, John Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, the uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson and his wife, um, and they are at the Rice Hotel. Uh, LULAC had invited the president to come and speak to the Mexican American community. And this was the first time that it happened. It was in 1963, 1963, actually the day before he was assassinated. He had come to Houston and it was at the Rice Hotel. It was through LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens, he, uh, and as a matter of fact, we actually have a recording of Jackie Kennedy welcoming the community in Spanish. And so that just uh, endeared her so much uh, to our community. And um, he went on to, um, I think, win. Well, unfortunately, he died, but win the hearts of our community in many ways. We have here um, myself. I was voted into office at, night, at the end of 1991, took office as a city council member at large, position one for the city of Houston uh, in 1992. I served for six years. I became the first Latina to be voted citywide in Houston, and I also became the first Latina to be uh, appointed as the mayor pro temp by then mayor um, Lanier. So, and then we have. Uh, Tijerina, that's right, Mr. Tijerina. Mr. Tijerina was a restaurant owner and he also was very important to our community, uh, very active. There were many things that he sponsored and he supported to fight the injustices, to fight um, you know, the, the inequality. Uh, he was pro-education and he was a man that was very well respected, not only with our community, but the community at large. So in many respects, he was a spokesperson for many of us. So you have it there, all of these uh, different um, images that depict the Mexican-American experience here in Houston, Texas. Oh, I just wanted to let also uh, mention that the two the artists who painted this beautiful mural are Jesse Cifuentes and Laura Lopez Cano. You know, this mural is something that uh, we did know that you guys will be, uh, you know, standing in front of the mural and telling us more about it. But the insights, the learnings that we have had from this are absolutely amazing. And it tells a story and not just one. It tells the entire uh, story of different to me, different people and how they came to become where they are right now. I just have a couple of questions. I wouldn't may, uh, want you guys to stand for so long. So I'll just quickly wrap this up. And yeah, just a couple of generic questions and any one of you uh, can answer this. Uh, so what is the most satisfying effort uh, or contribution that uh, your nonprofit, the Heritage Society, has made towards the Hispanic and Latin American community? Thank you so much. First of all, I want to extend a, a sincere thanks to you and your crew there that uh, have made this possible and, and telling our story globally uh, is, is amazing. Uh, we pride ourselves here in Houston uh, as a can-do city uh, and we continue to see that as, as possible. Right now, I think most uh, people see the city of Houston uh, being a city that is going to be what the rest of the U.S. is going to look like mm -hmm. in the future. And it's important for us to get it right. So the ability to, to work uh, and play with our diversity and inclusion, I think is, is something that we're all working towards. We do not want to see some of the mistakes of the past being repeated. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are vigilant. Uh, and we are working hard. I think one of the best contributions, uh, not only to the Heritage Society, uh, but 
Houston and Texas itself has made uh, are people like Graciela, uh, Christina Morales, and succeeding generations of Mexican American and Hispanics that have continued to contribute to the community, to grow it, to build it, to be vital and make us vital parts of the community and its uh, organizations uh, like the uh, the Heritage Society that continue to tell the story and not let that be forgotten uh, when there's so much going on in places like Houston and Texas in general. So there's one last question. Uh, since we, you know that, you know, Gudera basically uh, works with the corporate employees and the, the companies that uh, we have globally, the 200 companies that use our products and they come to help uh, uh, the nonprofits all across the globe. So, how can someone uh, from Gudera or uh, from from our corporate clients all over the world, or even based out of Texas or Houston uh, specifically, if they want to become an ally, become volunteers, uh, how can they help right now? How can they help virtually? So mm -hmm. many of our children are behind in school. Yes. Education, education, education. We need volunteers to help our ISDs tutoring, mentoring these children to move forward and to catch up. I would like to, you know, again, you know, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Graciela and Dr. Proyas and Allison, thank you so much for, you know, uh, having us coordinate this and bringing in Dr. Proyas and Graciela as well. Hi, I'm Allison Bell, Executive Director of the Heritage Society. We are so honored today to have our resident poet, Katrina Machetta, share with us a poem honoring National Hispanic Heritage Month. She will be sharing a poem called Esperanza. Katrina? Esperanza, from the touch of the language to the delight of every quinceanera, we remember our ancestors those who came before us, reflecting on all their contributions, generations of sacrifices, the sweat of every struggle and triumph, and bring history alive through every fiesta and family gathering. We sing the world into our songs and mariachi, and the world sees our grace through our bond with every generation. We are bonded to sisterhood and the brotherhood pillars of strong men. Our bond expands beyond state lines and deeper than the Gulf of Mexico. In the midst of silence, whispers of hope float in the air. Esperanza. Every year is a wave in the ocean of our heritage, from Tex-Mex murals to family-owned restaurants. This month is not here to celebrate one of us, but all of us. We all gather for our rich heritage to celebrate our resilience and vision of a bright tomorrow. Proverbs and stories passed down like a torch from one generation to the next. We come from a line of artists, activists, teachers, and more. We paint color in every generation. We walk unified among every culture, ethnicity, and group of people. We gallop along, educating others through our contributions, poetry, and works of art to show them history, being born again, and created in new ways through the Hispanic Heritage Commemoration. Thank you very much. I wish everyone a wonderful National Hispanic Heritage Month.